Make sure to check out the previous video in this series, link in the description. The student bar didn't have what I was looking for. Not at first, anyway. The drinks were fine and all, I just wasn't there to get drunk. I looked over my glass, the dimly lit room, seeing dozens of girls just like me and twice as many guys begging for their attention. I took another swig. It was a pathetic turnout. I guess you could say that I was something of a slut. An ugly word. Mum would be so proud. University hadn't been the social blossoming I was sold back in high school. And it wasn't long before I got burnt out. Tied to a degree I knew would lead to nothing. And looking forward to student debt for the next three decades. So I said to myself, You know what? Fuck it. A younger girl sat beside me and ordered some fruity cocktail. Huh. First year, I thought. But let me tell you, she was all leg. From the corner of my eye, I looked down at her well-toned thighs and calves. God damn! She must have run track before she came to this dead end of teenage perpetuation. Skin. I made a hobby of it, and soon it became like a game to me. A hunt, if you will. I stopped caring about grades, and every other night I potted down to this bar, on the prowl for whatever passed for a fine piece of ass in this place. And let me tell you, I had my fair share. Girls were like, they were like fruit, and I loved to go picking. The guys, well, they never really got that I didn't swing that way. The new girl that sat next to me with her fruity cocktail was nothing short of ripe. Her big, innocent eyes were like that of a lamb. I licked my lips. Sure, she had the dyed hair that screamed, I'm studying arts and I think I'm unique. It was green, but she wasn't just another colour out of a box. It's kind of quiet, she said nervously. I held up my glass and made the universal um actually face. Atmospheric. The word you're looking for is atmospheric. Green giggled something. Maybe told me her name, maybe not. I didn't really care what she had to say. I found my victim, and now I was on the hunt. I just started, back in the day, the studies. Where are you from? I caught bits and pieces of what she said remembering to nod and to make interested faces at all the right points. I liked the way her lips moved. I licked mine as I thought of what I could make them do. It's the damnedest thing. I don't actually remember what I said to hook her in. Green, like all the other girls like her, was so easy. Before I knew it, we were outside. I shivered. I always hated the cold. But Green held my hand and pranced along beside me like a little deer. Oh, it was such a good idea to watch the moon together, she said. You're so smart. There's a billabong nearby that'll be perfect. 
I grinned, watching her bounce excitedly. She reminded me of those innocent frigates back in high school. There's always one. A prude in recovery. Will she need help taking my bra off? I thought. What do you think? She asked, standing before the billabong like it was the most impressive thing she had ever seen. It's... Okay. And it really was just... Okay. A still little body of water, surrounded by trees and full of algae and clumps of weeds. Green stood at the shore, looking up at a moon that I must have feigned interest in. I came up behind, wrapped my arms around her perfectly flat belly, and kissed her neck. Fuck, she smelled so good. She was defenseless, so vulnerable, at the mercies of my sexual hunger. I felt powerful. My skin burned with excited blood. I slid my hands across her body and pulled at her blouse. All the while, she just smiled and looked at the moon. There was a mood-killing squelch as I trod in some mud. I grimaced as I felt cold bog water flood my shoe and wet my sock. Truly, there is nothing on earth worse than wet socks. I tried to pull my foot up without looking away from green, but there was a harsh tug of something snagged. I pulled again, slightly angled, might have held escape. No dice. Oh, for fuck's sake, I spat. I looked to my foot, to whatever the hell I had snagged it on. And my mouth went dry with a scared confusion. A hand. Coming out from the water of the billabong was a hand attached to a slender bare arm. What the fuck? I stared, not really with that Hollywood screaming terror, but confused more than anything. Something out of the blue, as it were. I tried to comprehend it. Then, suddenly, the arm tensed, its elbow bent, and using my leg as an anchor, pulled the naked upper body of a woman out from the billabong. She hissed at me. Her green hair flowed behind her into the weeds and algae. No. No, 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 it, it, it was the weeds and algae. I fell back into the mud and tried to kick her off, but with each consecutive pull, she came further and further out of the water, revealing more of her wet body, a body that seemed to grow dark and change form at around her belly button. I screamed at Green, help, get this fucking thing off me. She looked down at me, so pathetic. Vulnerable. She flashed a fanged smile, and there was a hunger in her eyes. I knew then that she was on the hunt. Her hair moved on its own now. I saw it writhe, algae green, like the monster's hair in the billabong, and it slithered about like hundreds of tiny snakes. Somebody! Help me! I screamed again, but Green simply raised an arm and waved her hand without taking her eyes off me. The dark clouds swirled to life, and the moon over Green's shoulder was quickly hidden by thick storm clouds. Lightning cracked, rain poured, and no one could hear my screams. Green got down and straddled me. As I hopelessly cried, she licked her lips. Her hands fiddled with the button on my shorts. 
and she brought her face closer to mine. I tried to push her off, but all the strength in my arms was nothing to her. She hardly moved. I turned my face away, cheek pressed hard into the mud, trying to keep away from whatever the hell green was. The monster woman, pulling herself from the billabong, sank her teeth into my leg just above the knee. The tendrils of Green's hair jerked and wrapped around my head. I was too weak to stop them. And they forced my face to Green's as she pursed her lips. There are many words to describe mermaids, but the word I'd like to use is limited. Fish women that sing you to your doom with only the power of your lust at their disposal. How do you beat a mermaid? It's simple. Move away from the coast. But the Yorker Yorker, or just Yorker for the sake of simplicity, is anything but simple. The traditional Danish story of the Little Mermaid depicts little fair-skinned Ariel wanting nothing more than to be able to walk on land. But the Yorker never found themselves trapped by the sea. These powerful creatures inhabited both fresh and salt water and, most importantly, possessed mild shape-shifting abilities. That's right, a Yorker doesn't yearn to be out where they dance, out where they run, out where they play all day in the sun, because if one so wished, she could simply just change her tail for legs and stroll onto shore in a matter of seconds. This power makes hunting far easier for Yorker, as they have the ability to lure unsuspecting men and women regardless of where they might be. A mermaid can't seduce you from the backseat of a car or the corner of a bar, but a Yorker can. That being said, Yorker are still aquatic creatures and cannot survive long out of water. So, in the end, they must always return to their home. Yorker come in three different types. Some are born with the lower half of a fish, visually appearing more like your traditional mermaid. Others, the curve of their hips doesn't melt into that of a salmon or a carp, rather a crocodile. That's right, half woman, half crocodile. And these make up the most common Yorker. Lastly, the rarest of the Yorker are born with the lower halves of dragonflies. Yes, that's right, some Yorker can even fly. A Yorker is able to get a sense of your desires and thus can subtly change its appearance to be more appealing to you. But its hair will always remain green. When in their natural state, a Yorker's hair resembles everything from algae to seaweed. It is said that if you see a body of water full of these things, it is actually full of Yorker. And if you're in a canoe and you see large clumps around you, beware, because it's actually the Yorker surrounding you. But don't look over the side. Yorker hair isn't just a pretty bit of greenery. It's just as alive as any other part of their body. Yorker hair is as articulate as fingers and even stronger than legs. They are known to use their hair to snatch those that look over the sides of boats and pull them into the depths. And if their hair gets a hold of you, it's never letting go. There's more though. Just when you thought Yorker were overpowered, they also have the ability to control the weather. Nothing draws people to lakes and billabongs quite like a swelteringly hot day. And nobody will hear the screams as a thunderous storm rolls in. Yorkers are seductresses, to be sure, but unlike Yinipa, they revel in it. 
nothing fills a Yorker with more glee than dragging a man into the depths, or turning a woman into one of them. They make victims of both genders, but fascinatingly, Yorkers are not bound by their victims, shall we say, interests. For example, if you're a lesbian woman, to a Yorker, you're fair game. And if you're a straight woman, well, let's just say that for the green-haired beauty that appears before you, you'll be more than just compelled to make an exception. It is unknown whether or not Yorkers are tied to the bunyip in any way, but being malevolent, shape-shifting creatures that dwell in Australia's many bodies of water, it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that they are in some way tied back to Kianpriti. Who knows? Perhaps the first Yorker was just a beautiful woman, given a poetically twisted curse from the bunyip. Regardless, the Yorker of today continued to kill men and corrupt women in the dark, wet spots of Australia. They are powerful, they are beautiful, and they most certainly are not your little mermaid.